Okay. Good day, class. I hope it is well with everybody, despite the pandemic that is going on. So we have to continue with the class from where we stopped before the lockdown. We realized that we did up to Article 13, and then we also talked about the uh, Annex 1. So we'll continue from that. And then what we have, we'll start from Article 19. And then Article 19 of the International Health Regulation talks about the general obligation that every state party or every country that has ascribed to the WHO is supposed to uh, go by. So that is what we will start with for today. And then as you, all, you already have the slide, so you go straight to Article 19 and then we'll, we'll take it up from there. And it says that each state party shall, in addition to other obligations provided for under this regulation, ensure that the capacity set forth in Annex 1 for designated point of entry are developed within the time frame provided in paragraph 1 of Article 5 and paragraph 1 of Article 13. We dealt with uh, Annex 1. And then you realize that the Annex 1 talks about the point of entry, those capacities that needs to be developed. So the obligation is mandating all state parties to ensure that they develop the capacity within the time frame that uh, the regulation is set, has, has talked about. And then we all know the time frame. And also, the state parties are also supposed to identify the competent authorities at each designated point of entry in this territory. So when you take, for example, you take Ghana, Ghana is supposed to let WHO know which point of entry, you know the point of entry, the airports, the seaports, and even the international ground crossing like the lorry station. So Ghana is supposed to let WHO know which of the ports that they have earmarked or identified to carry out the capacities that has been set out in the NS1 of the regulation. And then they are also supposed to furnish WHO when requested in response to specific potential public health risk, relevant data concerning sources of infection. So before you even year mark, before you year mark a port for, to carry out the designated capacity building, you also need to look at whether there is any risk, public health risk existing in those spots. So, for example, when you take the seaport, we have Tema and then we have Takrade. Which of the ports do you have public health risk existing? You have to, the state or the country has to let WHO know. Because between the two ports, which of them are you going to designate to carry out the capacity that has been set out in the annex one of the regulation? So you look at the public health risk existing, if it's Tema or if it's Kutuka, do you have any public health risk existing? And then you also look at the relevant data concerning the sources of infection. If there's any public health risk existing or any infection or contamination, where is it coming from? You look at the sources. Is it from those traveling? Or is it as a result of the facilities that travelers use at the point of entry? You also need to include, or you look at the relevant data concern, concerning the source of infection or contamination. Is it as a, as a result of water, or as a result of food, or contact, or whatever it is? You need to also indicate. And then you look at whether it's vector. Is it a vector-borne risk? And then the reservoir of infection at the point of entry. The country needs to furnish the breakthrough with all this information before you can designate the port to carry out the capacity that has been set out in the MS1. And then you also look at the risk. If yes, there's a risk, is it going to affect international travel? Is it going to spread internationally? Is it a risk that when you get it from Ghana, when you go to another country, you take it? Like what is happening now? You look at the COVID. COVID has international, the potential for international spread. 
you get it from Ghana. And then wherever you go, you are carrying it. People that you come in contact with, even in the, uh, the flight, all of them become, you, you have the potential to infect them. So you realize that COVID has a potential for international spread. So that is why when it started, most countries or most state parties had to close their borders and then they have to restrict entry and then out of their territories. Then we'll move on to Article 20. Article 20 talks about the ports and then the airports. And every state party or country shall designate the ports and airport that shall develop the capacity provided. So it's like the previous slide here is talking about the ports. So the airport, if it's Kutuka, Ghana, we have only one international airport. So in that, you realize that it's only Kutuka that can develop the capacities. But when it, come, it comes to the seaport, we have two. So Takradi and Tema, which one will develop the capacity? We have to designate one to do the training or the building of the capacity that has been talked about in the NS1. And then the state party shall also ensure that ship sanitation control exemption certificates and ship sanitation control certificates are issued in accordance with the requirements in Article 39 and the model that has been provided in an astray. So you realize that if you are traveling on a ship or when a ship is moving, it's not just moving. There are regulations that regulate their movement. So every party, every state party or country, you either issue, you inspect the ship and then based on your findings, you issue, there are two certificates that you have to issue. One is the ship sanitation control exemption certificate. And then the other is the ship sanitation control certificate. And then it depends on the findings. The findings determine which certificate that the country has to give to the ship that is moving. So if a ship is moving from Ghana to, for example, Nigeria, they have to inspect and make sure that the ship is not harboring any infection that can be traveled to or can be taken to Nigeria. And based on the findings of the, uh, the ship, you, the, the captain of the ship will get either of this certificate, the ship sanitation control exemption certificate, and then the san, uh, sanitation control certificate. And these certificates are issued to the captain of the ship. And then you, we have a sample. The sample is in a, an S3. So when we get there, you will see how it looks like. Every uh, department or every corner of the ship needs to be examined. And then based on the findings, you will get either of these certificates. Any question, if you have any question, you can email it to me and then we'll discuss. And then every country or state party shall also send to the bridge to a list of ports that they have authorized to offer the following services. Which port is supposed to issue the ship sanitation control certificate? And then you also look at the issuance of the ship sanitation control exemption certificate. Which ports are supposed to give it? For example, when you take Ghana, you have the two ports. Between Tema and Takrade, which of the ports is supposed to issue the uh, ship sanitation control certificate? So wherever they do the uh, examination, that is where the certificate will be issued. So you, that is why the previous slide, we talked about the fact that the state party will have to let WHO know which of the ports within their territory. In other countries, they may have several a port of, they may have several seaports or airports, which are all international, but Ghana, we have just, when you talk about airports, we have just Kotuka, but with the seaports, we have the two. So we have to earmark which of them should issue any of these certificates. And then there's also extension. For example, if the ship is, or the aircraft is inspected, and then you find contamination or infection on it, then it means that they have to give you that exemption certificate. And then they have to give you a period within which you have to clean your ship or disinfect or disinsect the ship or decontaminate. And then they will have to come back and inspect it again and see if everything is 
okay, there's no infection on board, there's no contamination. But for some reason, if you are not able to clean the ship or sanitize the ship, then the ship will have to be given an extension. They have to give you an extension, maybe for six months or something. Then they come back and then inspect. And when they do the second inspection and everything is okay, then they give you the, the ship's sanitation control exemption certificate. So the extension to, they have to earmark which of the ports will have to give that extension. Any question on that? Like I said, we, will have to, we can discuss the questions on the page on the uh, WhatsApp platform. Any question, and then you can also email me or call me on that, then we will discuss. Then each country shall also inform the bridge of any changes which may occur to the status of the listed port. The bridge shall publish the information received under this paragraph. So if for a reason a country felt that they have to change the ports that is supposed to train people or develop the capacity. They have to also inform WHO because whatever information you give to WHO, WHO also publish it so that other nationals, other countries will also inf be informed. They will be in the known that when you go to Ghana, maybe Kot uh, Kotoka or the Tema port, they, are, they carry out this inspection of the ship or they are supposed to give the, any of the two certificates. So if for some reason Ghana decide that we have now, we are no longer using Temaport, then it means that they have to inform WHO and then WHO also publish it for other countries to also be in the known and also for other conveyance operators to also be in the known. So when you, they will be in the known when you come to Ghana and you realize that this competent authority is inspecting your ship, then you know that they have been mandated to do that. Then WHO may, at the request of the state party concerned, arrange to certify after an appropriate investigation that an airport or port in its territory meets the requirement referred to in paragraph one. So we are not just doing anything. The, the port that you even hear mark that the training should go on, the inspection of the uh, conveyance or the ship, the issuance of the certificate, WHO will also have to verify. They have to also investigate to see that truly those ports that you have hear mark, they have all the requirements to build the capacities that you have or you said you will do all the things that they are supposed to do, they will also have to investigate to be sure that they have the capacity to provide the services that the regulation has provided. And then the certificates may also be subject to periodic review by WHO in consultation with the state party. So even when you get the certificate, WHO will have to also review it it's not like one off thing. If they, gave, they give you the license or certification that you can provide the capacities mentioned in this one, from time to time, the bridge will have to consult with the country and find out that still the port that you earmark, they still have what it takes to provide the services that the regulation has provided. Then the bridge in collaboration with competent intergovernmental organization and international bodies shall develop and publish the certificates, certification guidelines for airport and ports under this article. WHO shall also publish a list of certified ports and then the ports. As I was telling you, that the British will let other nationals be in the know, the ports that you earmark to provide the services. And in doing that, they have to publish it. They have to publish it in their, in their website, the guidelines, even for you to determine or earmark a port to provide the services. There are guidelines that you have to follow.
and it's the duty of WHO to give every country the guidelines. What are the things that should be in place? What are the things that you are, you are looking out for? If it's about disinfection, what, how do you go about it? If it's about decontamination, how do you go about it? And all will have to be in the guidelines, and the guidelines is provided by WHO. And they also publish it at their website. And then certification, all the ports that they certify to provide the services needed, they have to publish it so that when you go to their website, you have you see all the ports that have been certified to provide the services that is talked about in the, the NS1. Article 21 talks about the ground crossing. I hope you know what a ground crossing is. Where justify for public care reasons. A state party may designate ground crossing that shall develop the capacities provided in an S1, taking into consideration. So you realize that we are still on the capacities, we are still on the training that should be given when it comes to implementation of these guidelines. And then when it comes to the, the, uh, the ground crossing, these are the things that needs to be in place. These are the things that the country will have to look out for. First, you look out for the volume. So if you are taking a ground crossing, for example, you know what a ground crossing is. For example, if we, we say we should take a flower, people entering and leaving Ghana, they all have to pass through, most of them, depending on where you are going. For example, our fellow Nigerians, when they are coming, their point of entry, their ground crossing to Ghana is a Aflao border. So Ghana can say that we are earmarking Aflao to provide the services or the capacity when it comes to ground crossing. But before you do that, you realize that there are also other ground crossing. Those going to uh, La Côte d'Ivoire, they also pass through, is it... Uh, a Lubo or whatever. So that place is also a ground crossing. So Ghana will have to earmark which of these, even when you go to Paga in the upper, uh, the upper west region, it is also a ground crossing. So now Ghana will have to earmark which of them to provide the services that they talked about in an S1. And before Ghana can do that, we will have to look at the volume and then the frequency of the various types of international traffic. Which of these ground crossings has the highest movement of people? So you look at that, that is the volume. And then how often do people come in and then leave the country? As compared to other points of entry. So you look at that, if it's a flower, which of them is busy? The volume, you are looking at the volume. You are looking at the frequency of the international travel there. If it's a flower, or if it's a lubo, these are the things that should guide you to be able to know which ground crossing to provide the capacities that we mentioned in an S1. Then B, you also look at the public health risk existing in, in the areas in which the international traffic originates. So first, you are looking at the volume, you are looking at the frequency, and then the various type of the international travel. Then you also look at the public health risk that exists in wherever the international travel is coming from. So for example, if somebody is coming from Nigeria to Ghana, somebody is also coming from La Côte d'Ivoire to Ghana or Burkina Faso to Ghana, which of these areas do you have public health risk existing? Example, during the Ebola time, you realize that Nigeria was among the first African countries to, to report cases. So if for that, at that time, we, if we are to look at uh, the criteria to select ground crossing where the services that we talked about in an S1 should be provided, then we can take Nigeria as one because at that time there was a public health risk existing. Wherever those Nigerians coming from, Coming from Nigeria, there, there was a public health risk existing. Because at the time that Nigeria reported the case of COVID, La Côte d'Ivoire and Burkina Faso had not recorded any case. So these are the things that will guide in selecting which ground crossing to build the capacities that 
we mentioned in an S1. And then you also look at where the travel, where the, the journey passes through. You are looking at where they start. The passengers or the travelers, the international travelers, where they start from. And then the areas that they pass through. Wherever maybe it could be that where their, their travel or their journey originates, there's no any public health risks existing. But the countries that they are passing through before they get to the final destination, there could be public health risks existing. So that should also guide you in selecting the Grand Crossing to provide the services. So in the same way, when you talk about the, those uh, fellow Nigerians, where they were coming from, do they have any public health risks existing? If no, do you know that they passed through Benin and then Togo before they come to Ghana? In Benin, was there any public health risk? In Togo, was there any public health risk? So these are the things that should guide you in selecting the ground crossing to provide the capacities. And then state parties sharing common borders should also consider, one, entering into bilateral or multilateral agreements or arrangement concerning prevention or control of international transmission of diseases at ground crossing in accordance with Article 57. P countries that share common border, they have to come in agreement as to how to prevent or control international spread or transmission of disease. So for example, Ghana and Togo. Ghana can say that I've closed my border. I don't want any person to cross over to Ghana to avoid the spread of COVID-19. But if Togo still open their border, then it means that Ghana, haven't, we haven't done anything. Because even now, every now and then, you realize that people try to uh, cross on approved route to enter Ghana in the uh, OT region. People entered through on approved route from Togo to Ghana. And then when they even tested them, most of them tested positive. And the same way, when you, I think the case that were reported in uh, Northern region, it's also the same thing. Yes. So it's better that if you share a common border, you agree on the prevention of the transmission of the disease. Because now the COVID is all over. So if Ghana crosses its, uh, its borders, then it, it means that the, the bordering uh, nations will also have to close their borders. And then you need to agree with them. So that the countries will have to come in agreement as to how they will prevent or control the international spread or transmission of disease, especially when it comes to ground crossing. And then the same way, joint designation of adjacent ground crossing for the capacity in an S1. So even in training people to be able to prevent, detect, prevent transmission of international spread of uh, disease, it's important that countries that share border will have to come together and then they do the training together. Because Ghana cannot say that we have trained our people and then Togo, you also not train your people. If you do that, you will not be able to achieve in a uh, go or will not be able to prevent the transmission of diseases. Then Article 22. Article 22 talks about the role of the competent authorities. And we all know who the competent authorities are. And these are their role. First, they have to be responsible for monitoring baggage, cargo, containers, conveyances, goods, postal parcels, and human remains departing and arriving from affected areas so that they are maintained in such a condition that they are free of sources of infection or contamination, including vectors and then reservoirs. So these are the competent authorities, their duty or their role. First and foremost, DS is to monitor. They will have to monitor the baggage. You know what a baggage is monitor a baggage, the cargoes, the containers, the conveyances. So everything that is entering Ghana 
entering, not Ghana, everything that is entering a state party is the duty of the competent authorities to monitor. And then the aim of the monitoring is to make sure that these items are free of sources of infection or contamination. And then they are also free of vectors and then the reservoirs of vectors. So they have to monitor. If there's the need to inspect the baggage, the human remains. You know what the human remains is. The corpses that at times they travel with. It's like somebody travel and the person dies there. And then you want the family will be want the person to be buried in the, their, their home countries. They, they, they travel with that, the dead body. They have to find out whether that, that dead body is not carrying any sources of infection. And it's the duty of the competent authority to also monitor it. And then they have to also ensure that facilities used by travelers at point of entry are maintained in a sanitary condition and are kept free of sources of infection or contamination, including vectors and then the reservoirs. They have to make sure that the facilities that travelers use at the various points of entry, the toilets, the eating places and all that, should, they have to make sure that they are free of any source of infection. Because the aim of the regulation is to prevent people carrying infection, contamination from one country to the other. So at every point of entry, you have, they have to make sure that when you go, the facilities should be clean. The facilities there should be neat. And then when you assess the facilities, you are sure that you are not carrying any infection to wherever you are going. And then they are also responsible for the supervision of any derating, disinfection, disinsection or decontamination of baggage, cargo containers, conveyances, goods, postal parcels, and human remains, or sanitary measures for persons as appropriate under this regulation. They have to supervise if they are decontaminating any uh, ship or any baggage or they are the rats, especially in the ship, there can be rats there. And then one rat in the ship can cause a whole lot of havoc. havoc. So there's the need to, if there's any evidence that there are uh, vectors or there are rats on board the ship or the cargoes, there's the need to, to derate them. And then it is the duty of the competent authority to supervise these activities to make sure that everything is perfect. There is no infection on board. And then any sanitary measures that is applied, especially to persons, the competent authority will have to make sure that they are also safe. So anything that happens at the various ports, harbors, and then the ground crossings, it is the duty of the competent authority to supervise and also monitor it. They also need to advise the conveyance operators as far as in advance as possible of their intent to apply control measures to conveyance and shall provide where available written information concerning the methods to be employed. So, yes, they have to supervise the derating and all those things. But then they have to give the conveyance operators, you know who the conveyance operators are. They have to give them advance notice. So, for example, a ship that is, that there's the need to derat, you have to give the uh, captain an advance notice that maybe next month or whatever, we'll have to derat your, your ship so that they, have to, they will be in the known and then they also prepared for that. If it's a bus going from Ghana to to go, and there's the need to uh, disinfect the bus. You have to give the bus driver, the conductor, an advance notice. And then you also need to let them know which method you are going to use. Is it the rating, the contamination? Are you going to spray or what? Like we did recently, that we disinfected the whole Accra. Most countries disinfected their cities and then there are buses. So you can't just come and disinfect my bus without giving me prior notice. You have to give them prior notice 
and then you need to also let them know when you are going to uh, disinfect or decontaminate their conveyances. And this will have to be in a, a, a written form. You give them a written information and then you also tell them the method that you are going to, to use. Because some of these health measures, the chemicals that you use can also be harmful to human life. It can be harmful to cargo, it can be harmful to food and other things. And then they also need to also take appropriate measures to uh, keep their conveyances also safe. So that is why there's the need to inform them in advance. And then they are also responsible for the supervision of the removal and safe disp uh, disposal of any contaminated water, food, human or animal dejector, wastewater, and any other contaminated matter from a conveyance. So it's a, a, the duty of the competent authorities to supervise the removal of all this from a conveyance. It could be a ship. If it's a, a ship that you have a, an infection on board or there's a waste on board, even the removal of it, it has to be supervised by the competent authorities. You can't just go and dump your, your waste or your sewage in somebody's international, other country's international water. It has to be supervised. You realize that from time to time, they will tell you that there's a contaminated uh, food uh, from Thermaport and then they are going to dispose of it. That disposition, at times they burn it and all that, is the competent authorities, they have to supervise that. So that you don't just go and then you come and tell us that you have disposed of it. And at the end, if, if, uh, some of, if it's a food item, it can find its way to the market. And consumption can also be detrimental to human health. So the competent authorities will have to also supervise the removal and the dispo uh, disposal of all these items. It could be the ship, it could be a uh, plane, cargo, it could also be in a, a, a bus or something. So as I was saying, you have, to, you have to do that. That is why we take the yellow fever inoculation. And then you, we, we'll, do, we'll need to do that. If there's a need for you to take that inoculation, then you do that. If there is a need for any medical examination, it should be non-invasive, and then it should also be uh, the least intrusive. The non-invasive, we know what a non-invasive is. When you are taking somebody's temperature and all that, you are looking at the years and all that, they are all non-invasive. But if there is the need to uh, be intrusive, you go deeper, then it should be the least. So for example, the, the yellow fever vaccine, it's a, it's a least intrusive if there's the need because to do that. We are looking at public health risk. So if they suspect that where you are going or where you are coming, there's a, a public health risk existing, then you need to go through certain medical examination and it should be non-invasive and it should be least intrusive. Then inspection of baggage, cargo containers, conveyances, goods, postal parcels, and human remains. All these items will have to be inspected. The, the baggage, your cargo, your containers, your goods and postal parcels will need to be inspected. If it's, it's something that you, you are not supposed to travel with, then they will not allow you to travel with that. When you go to the, some of the airports, you realize that they've pasted, you see they've pasted a list of items that you are not supposed to travel with. You see them. So if they should find anything in your, in your things, then they can, you can be uh, prosecuted or they may just confiscate it. And then on the basis of evidence of a public health risk, on the basis of evidence of public health risk, obtained through the measures provided in paragraph one of this article or through other means, state parties may apply additional health measures. So these are the health measures that the regulation has spelled out. Notwithstanding, if there's the need to apply additional measures, all countries that has ascribed to the WHO have the uh, mandate to apply other additional health measures. If provided the health measures, the additional health measures, who achieve the public health aim of 
preventing international spread of disease. Especially when it comes to suspects or affected travelers. On a case-by-case -case basis, the least intrusive and invasive medical examination that will achieve the public health objective or prevent the, uh, the international spread of disease. That is what I was just saying. They are supposed to apply the health measures that the, uh, the regulation has spelled out. But if for some reason there is any uh, suspected traveler, the country has the mandate or the authority to apply other health uh, measures. And then those health measures to aim at achieving the public health objective issue should aim at achieving preventing international spread of disease. And then it should be no, it should be the least intrusive or invasive examination. And it should be on case by case basis. The case by case basis, yes, because for for example, all of us we are traveling. You are all in the same flight traveling. And then you are checking our temperature. And the one person's temperature is up, and then you suspect that person. Meanwhile, all of us, we all had our uh, temperatures were normal. You have to deal with that person alone. You can't say that because we are all in the same flight, then it means that maybe, for example, we all have Ebola or we all have uh, COVID-19. You, you, you deal with the traveler on a case-by-case basis. And then all should be in achieving the public health aim or objective of preventing international spread of disease. Then no medical examination, vaccination, prophylaxis, or health measure under this regulation. No medical examination, vaccination, prophylaxis, or health measures under this regulation shall be carried out on travelers without their prior express informed consent or that, that of their parents or guardians, except as provided in paragraph 2 of Article 33 and in accordance with the law and international obligation of the state party. You have to note this section. No medical examination vaccination, prophylaxis, or health measures under this regulation shall be carried out on travelers without their prior express informed consent. So you cannot apply this uh, health measures or do any medical examination on a traveler without the person's uh, consent. If you are giving vaccination, it should be by the person's consent. The person will have to agree to it. You can't just do it. You cannot come and give me vaccination when I have not agreed to it. If you do that, somebody can sue you. And if you are giving prophylaxis, you know what a prophylaxis is for prevention of diseases. Even that, you need the person's consent. If by reason the person cannot consent, the person is, uh, is a child and cannot consent, then you need the, the consent of the guardian or the parent. If for some reason the person is, uh, let me see, is it uh, mentally deranged, then you need the consent of the guardian or the parent. You can't say that because a person is mentally deranged, well, that person doesn't know anything, so you can do anything on that person you need the person's approval. You need the person's consent before you can carry out any medical examination. Travelers to be vaccinated or offered prophylaxis pursuant to this regulation or the appearance or guidance shall be informed of any risk associated with vaccination or with non-vaccination and with the use or non-use of prophylaxis in accordance with the law and international obligation of the state party. So the vaccination, the examination that you are giving, you, they have to, 
you have to explain everything to the traveler or the parents or guardians. You have to let them know the, 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 the safety aspect of it. That if you take, for example, if you take the yellow fever, or if, for example, if we should have vaccine for COVID, you have to explain that when we are given the COVID vaccine, when you come in contact with an affected person, you may not contract it. You let them know. And then you also let them know the risk of taking the vaccine because you know vaccines, they may also have their adverse risk. They may also have adverse effect. So you let them know that maybe when you take it, you have this reaction. You let them know. And then those who say that you will not take it, like now what is happening, that even though the vaccine for COVID hasn't come out, people are crying foul that even through the vaccine, the, the uh, international community, especially the America, they may put things inside that will rather wipe we the Africans and then they will come and take over our, our country or our land. So already people are preparing people's mind not to take that vaccine. So you will also need to let them know what they stand for. If you don't take the vaccine, the dangers that you, you also stand for. So vis-a-vis, -vis, if you take the vaccine, this is what will happen. If you don't take it, this is what will happen. You have to give the information to the traveler so that the traveler can make an informed choice. And all these things will have to be within the laws, the international obligations of that state party. And this state party shall inform medical practitioners of this requirement in accordance with the law of the state party. So medical practitioners should be in the known of the vaccines that when you are traveling, you have to take. You realize that, I think I've forgotten the year, they, they played the World Cup in South, South Africa. And then the Ghanaian contingency that went, they were supposed to take, uh, I think that was, was it when they had the bird flu? They were supposed to take the vaccine, and they didn't take it. So when they got to South Africa, they didn't allow them to enter. You either take, and then you pay. You pay so much, or the next available flight, you go back to your country. So the medical practitioners will have to be in the know that these are the, uh, the mandatory health measures that should be for every person traveling. And then nobody is supposed to be an exemption. Then any medical examination, medical procedure, vaccination or other prophylaxis which involves a risk of disease transmission shall only be performed on or administered to a traveler in accordance with established national or international safety guidelines. Any medical examination, medical procedure, vaccination or other prophylaxis which involve a risk of disease transmission shall only be performed on or administered to a traveler in accordance with established national or international safety guidelines and standards as to minimize such risk. Any medical examination and medical uh, procedures, vaccination, which involve the risk of disease transmission. So you realize that some of the, especially the vaccine, some they call it attenuated uh, vaccine. The attenuated vaccine, actually, they have the live organism inside. For example, I think the measles or whatever, one of them, they have this, and then you see that they have a live a virus or bacteria inside, but just that they have weakened it so that it will, when they give it to you, it will not, it's not supposed to give you a, the disease, but rather protect you. But some of them will actually, after taking it, will actually be against you. So they have to let people know. And then when you are giving people such a vaccine or medical examination that will, may result in disease transmission, there are certain international guidelines that you need to follow. And that has, that has to be followed to the core so that you minimize such risk. Even this, our common uh, chloroquine, those days that we take the chloroquine injection, people have serious reaction to it. 
So when you are giving somebody the injection, there should be an antidote by it. Somebody can just die within a short minute by reacting to some of these uh, medical procedures. So you have to follow that international safety guidelines and then you make sure that you minimize such risk. All right, so we we'll move to Article 24. And Article 24 is about conveyance operators. You know what the conveyance is and who are the operators. When you look at the definition when we started, it will let you, it will clear your understanding and let you know who the conveyance operators are. And they also have obligation that they have to follow. Every state party shall take all practical measures consistent with this regulation to ensure that conveyance operators comply with the health measures recommended by WHO and adopted by the state party. So it is the duty of the countries or the state parties to make sure that conveyance operators comply with all those health measures that we just talked about and also inform travelers of the health measures recommended by WHO and adopted by the state party for applicable for application on board. So the state party will have to let the conveyance operators be in the known of the health measures that WHO has come out with and also inform travelers of the health measures so that when you apply it on travelers, they, they will not be suspicious. Everybody knows that when you are traveling, these are the health measures that you have to follow or go through. And also permanently keep conveyances for which they are responsible free of sources of infection. So conveyance operators, they have to make sure that their conveyances don't harbor any source of infection or contamination. There, sh there should not be any vectors or reservoir on board of any of the conveyance. And then the application of measures to control sources of infection or contamination may be required if evidence is found. So conveyance operators, these are the, their duties. They have to make sure that their conveyances are free of sources of infection. And then they also make sure that there is also periodic application of measures to control sources of infection and contamination if there's the need or there's evidence that they, they harbor any source of infection in their con uh, conveyances. And then when you, you look at the NS4 and the NS5 talks about specific provisions concerning or pertaining to conveyance operators. The NS4 talks about the, uh, what conveyances are supposed to, the operators are supposed to do and then the measures that should be in place in any conveyance, regard, especially regarding the uh, vector bone diseases, and that is in the NS5. And I think I will send NS5 to you through your WhatsApp. But this is the NS4. NS4 talks about the technical requirements pertaining to conveyance and then conveyance operators. The NS4 and the NS5, you don't have it on the slides that I gave you, so I'll have to send it to you. As I was telling you, NS4 talks about the requirements for conveyance and conveyance operators. So the conveyance operators, first, conveyance operators shall, first, they are supposed to facilitate the inspection of the cargo containers and conveyances. They facilitate the inspection of con uh, containers and conveyances. And then they are supposed to also facilitate medical examination of persons on board their conveyance, then application of other health measures under this regulation, and then provision of relevant public health information requested by the state party. So these are the rules of the conveyance operators. The is to facilitate a, the inspection of the cargo and containers and conveyance, then medical examination of persons on board their conveyances, then application of other health measures under this regulation, application of other health measures on their conveyances, and then the provision of relevant public health information. If the state party or the country where they operate, if there's the need for any public health information regarding their conveyance, 
they are supposed to. It's the duty of the conveyance operators to provide. Then conveyance operators shall also provide to the competent authority a valid ship sanitation control exemption certificate or a ship sanitation control certificate or a maritime declaration of health, the health part of an aircraft general declaration. So these are all health documents. We talked about the ship sanitation control exemption certificate and then the sanitation control certificate. So in the ship, a ship when it's moving, based on inspection, the ship is either giving ship sanitation control exemption certificate or sanitation control certifi certificate. And there is also another document called maritime declaration of health. So the maritime declaration of health also spelled out the, the health status of the, the ship that is moving. Then when you come to aircraft, then they also have the document that they call the aircraft general declaration of a, a health. Within the aircraft, we have the, the general declaration of a health status in it. And it's the duty of the pilot to provide to the competent authorities. So the conveyance operators are supposed to provide to the competent authorities this document that has been listed. And that is what the NS4 of the regulation talks about. Then the session B is also about conveyance. Conveyance, conveyances, control measures apply to baggage, cargo containers, conveyances, and goods, and that this regulation shall be carried out so as to avoid, as far as possible, injury or dis, uh, discomfort to person or damage to the baggage cargo. I've talked about this already. So in applying the conveyance within the conveyances, when you're applying any health measure, you have to make sure that you are not going to injure or discomfort any person. Neither are you going to damage any baggage cargo or containers or conveyances. And then whenever possible, an appropriate control measures shall be applied when the conveyance and holds are empty. You realize that in applying the health measures, we are saying that you have to avoid injury or damage. So it's better the health measures are applied or control measures are applied when the conveyance is empty. Conveyance is empty, the holds is empty. They're normally, what the holds are applied to the ship. So you realize you have to make sure that if you are applying any health measure to a ship, it has to be done when the ship is empty. If it's an aircraft, it has to be done when the aircraft is empty. If it's a, a, a if it's a passenger car, it has to be done when it is empty so that you don't discomfort any human being, you don't destroy any cargo or goods of people. And then state parties shall include in writing the measures applied to cargo containers or conveyances, the parts treated, the method employed, and the reason for the application. So within the state party, Anytime they inspect any conveyance, they have to give a written information to the conveyance operators. So you have to indicate the areas that you treat, the method that you use. If it's a derating, how did you go about it? If it's disinfection, is it by spraying and all that? You have, all these things will have to be in a written form and it's, it should be given to the one in charge of if it's an aircraft, the one in charge of the aircraft. And if it's, it's a, the ship, you, you, it has to be on the ship sanitation control certificate. So if it's an aircraft, a written document, and then you give it personally to the one in charge of the aircraft. And we know the pilot is the one in charge of the aircraft. But if it is a ship, you have to, it has to be indicated on the ship sanitation control certificate. And it's also given to the one in charge of that ship, and that is the captain. For other cargo containers and conveyances, state parties shall issue such information in writing to consigners. The consigner is the one sending or sending a shipment or the goods, 
and then consignee is the one receiving. So if it's apart from the, the, the ship or the aircraft, for any other cargo or any conveyance, they have to issue, the such information will have to be in written form and is given to the consigner, the consign, either the consigner, the consignee, the carrier, and then the person in charge of that conveyance or their respective agent. So whoever is an agent of the conveyance can also be given the written information where you indicate whatever you did, the, the method that you use, if it's a debriefing, how did you go about it? And it has to be in a written form and then you give it to the person in charge of the, the conveyor. The, uh, the conveyance, and it can also be the consignee, the one sending the goods, and then even the one receiving the goods. And then the Annex 5. Annex 5 talks about measures for vector bone diseases. How do you deal with vector bone diseases? And then WHO shall publish on a regular basis a list of areas where disinsection or other vector control measures are recommended for conveyances arriving from these areas. So WHO is the duty of WHO to publish the list, let people know which areas are endemic for vector bone diseases. That when you are coming from these areas, maybe you may need to take certain precautions. And then when you arrive at a, a, another state party, they also need to take certain precautions. So you have, they, they will publish the list of areas where you have vector borne diseases. We, we, when you look at, I think I went to do some course in Manchester, and over there when you go, there's this small booklet that they give you. And then they have listed in that book, they list areas where you go, the precaution that you need to take. For example, if you are coming to Africa, they tell you that these are, the diseases that public health diseases or disease that has public health importance, then you have to be cautious of. They have all that. So that is it. The WHO will have to list, publish the list of endemic areas where you have danger zones. If you are going to this place, these are the conditions that the vector bone conditions existing in those areas. And then they will publish it to, to let people know so that the necessary precaution can be taken. Then every conveyance leaving a point of entry situated in an area where vector control is recommended should be disinsected and keep free of vectors. Every conveyance leaving a point of entry situated in an area where vector bone control is recommended should be disinsected and kept free of vectors. So if a conveyance operator, any conveyance leaving an endemic area, areas where you have any source of infection, then it means that that container will have to be disinfected. You have to apply health measures to that container. And when there are methods and then materials advised by organization, that is the WHO, for this procedures, this should be employed. So in disinfecting or disinfecting the conveyances, you have to apply the methods that WHO has specified. And then if there are also other measures that can achieve the same, uh, the same aim stated by the state party, you have to apply that. But strictly, you have to go by what WHO has also specified. And then the presence of vector, vectors on board the conveyance and then the control measures used to eradicate them shall be included. So you have to also, when you are using WHO methods, you also look at the control measures. Which control measures are you using to eradicate them? You have to include everything. In the case of aircraft, so it's the same as previously what we talked about. It should be in a, a written form, and then it should be given to whoever is in, in charge of the conveyance. It has to be on the, if it's an aircraft, you give it to the general declaration, the aircraft general declaration. 
And if it's the ship, it has to be on the ship sanitation control certificate. Then in the case of conveyances, on a written proof of treatment issued to the consignee. So the method is the same as what is spelled out in the NS4. And then state parties should accept disinsecting, directing, and other control measures for conveyances applied by other states if methods and materials advised by WHO have been used. So every country, you have to, whatever, if you, before you can even apply any health measure, you look at where the, uh, the conveyance is coming from. If they applied health measures, and the measures they applied is the same as what WHO has specified, you have to accept that. So, for example, a, a, a plane coming from, uh, let's say, UK to Ghana in this week of the COVID, if they had applied health measures that are successful, and that measure is something that WHO has approved, Ghana, when the, the aircraft gets to Ghana, Ghana will have to accept it. You can't say that, no, I will not, unless you have evidence that that health measure is not successful. But if you don't have any evidence and you think it's successful, and the person used the, the, the con uh, conveyance operator used what the WHO has specified, then Ghana, you, you are obliged to accept you, are, you have to accept that health measure that was applied by that state party. Then state parties shall establish programs to control vectors that may transport an infectious agent that constitute a public health risk to a minimum distance of 400 meters from those areas of point of entry facilities. State parties shall establish programs to control vectors that may transport an infect, uh, infectious agent that constitutes a public health risk. So all that is saying is that in applying the health measure, you have to make sure that you restrict the conveyance from a point where uh, travelers are. At least it should be away from that point by 400 meters. You don't disinfect or derate or apply the health measures where the travelers are because you realize that we talked about the fact that you have to avoid injury to persons, comfort to persons, damage to uh, cargo, baggage, and all that. So in applying the health measure or control, vector control measures, you restrict the, the affected conveyance to a minimum distance of 400 meters from those areas of point of entry facilities that are used or operated involving travelers, conveyance, containers, and all that, because we are avoiding discomfort and injury to persons and then cargo and other things. If a follow-up inspection is required to determine the source of the vector control measures applied, the competent authorities for the next known port or airport of call with a capacity to make such an inspection shall be informed of this requirement in advance by the competent authority advising such follow-up. If a follow-up inspection is required to determine the success of the vector control measures applied, the competent authorities for the next known ports or airports of call with a capacity to make such an inspection shall be informed of this requirement. So if there's any proof that the health measures applied wasn't successful and there's the, the follow-up inspection to make sure that the measures were successful, then the competent authority at the, wherever uh, the conveyance or the aircraft, wherever the aircraft is going, you have to also find out from where they initiated the, uh, the health measures. So you can't just sit at one point and say that maybe, for example, the conveyance is coming to Ghana. Then it comes to Ghana and Ghana says that, oh, it's not successful. The measures that Nigeria applied wasn't successful. When you don't have any evidence. But if you have evidence, then you have to also let Nigeria know that the measures that they 
apply the health measures or the control measures that they applied was not successful. So there's the need for Ghana to also reapply the health measures again. And all these things will have to be on the ship sanitation control certificate, all those traveling documents by the conveyances. And a conveyance may be regarded as suspect and should be inspected for vectors and reservoirs if the following are applied. Before a, a state party or country can say that a conveyance is affected, all these may, uh, conditions will have to be applicable. First, it has, you have to be sure that it has a possible case of vector bond disease on board. So if you earmark a, a conveyance as unaffected, it has to have a case, a possible case of vector bond disease on board. You should have evidence that there's a disease causing agent on board. And then B, a possible cause of vector bond disease. There's actual, there's the cause of a vector bond disease. For example, you have seen a rat on it, on the ship. Then you, you, you know that there's a possible case of vector bond disease. And then it has also occurred on board during the international voyage. So in the international travel, as the ship is moving, you have, in, you have indication that there is a case of vector bond disease on, on board. Then you can see that that ship is affected. Then it has left an affected area within a period of time where on board vectors could still carry diseases. So these are the conditions. First, you are looking at whether there's a possible case of vector bond disease. And then there's another one is a case of vector bond disease has occurred whilst in the course of the journey, somebody has reported with a, a vector bond disease. And then the, the uh, conveyance is also leaving or just left an affected, affected area, area where there's evidence that there's a vector bond disease. So you realize that South Korea or Singapore, there was this uh, cruise ship that they quarantined. And then there were also cases of uh, COVID on board cruise ship. So they had to quarantine that cruise ship. It became a suspect. And I think America too, they, there was a ship like that. So before you can uh, classify a ship as an affected, all these conditions will have to be applicable. Then a state party should not prohibit the landing of an aircraft or berthing of a ship in its territory if the control measures provided for in paragraph 3 of the annex or otherwise recommended by WHO are applied. So state party or country, you don't have, you have no right to say that you not allow any ship to berth or board at your, your port. If that the ship has used, actually used the health measures that WHO has uh, specified, you can say that you will not let the ship stop at your port. If the ship, they have used the recommended health measures specified by WHO, then no country can prevent or prohibit the landing of such an aircraft or a ship. However, aircraft or ship coming from an affected area may be required to land at airports or divert to another port specified by the state party. We are saying that, the, or the regulation is saying that if health measures specified by WHO has been applied, no country has the right to stop or prohibit the landing of an aircraft in its territory. But then, if the aircraft is coming from an affected area, then they will have to, they will require that it will land at an airport or divert to another port, another place, so that further investigation can be done. If health measures has been applied to an aircraft, no state party or no country can prevent it from landing. But if that aircraft is coming from an area that we know that is a danger zone, though like initially when the COVID started happening in China, if we know that an aircraft is coming from China, then Ghana could have said that 
we will not let you land at Kutuka. Land somewhere, and then we'll come and check if there's no any uh, infection on board before we can allow you to come in, land at the appropriate place. So that is what this session is talking about. A state party may apply vector control measures to a conveyance arriving from an affected, an area affected by the vector borne disease. If the vectors for the foregoing disease are present in its territory, a state party may apply vector borne measures to a conveyance arriving from an area affected by a, a vector borne disease. If the vector for the foregoing disease are present in its territory, so you, you realize that this is a two-way thing. The, the uh, conveyance is coming from an affected area. And then wherever the conveyance is going, there's also, it's also an affected area. Or if the same disease condition is happening there, then there's the need to apply for that state party to apply control measures. You are coming from an affected area. And then where you are coming to, we ourselves, we are also affected then it means that they have to apply control measures to that uh, conveyance or the aircraft coming so that you will be sure that the necessary precaution or prevention has gone on. Then they also need to take all practical measures because we are still on the uh, role of the competent authorities. They also need to take all practical measures consistent with this regulation to monitor and control the discharge by ship of sewage, refuge, ballast water, and other potentially disease-causing matter, which might contaminate the waters of a port, river, canal, strait, lake, or other international waterway. So they, in the ship, they also need to dispose of their, their sewage. But how do they do it? Somebody once asked, that if even when you're in the, uh, the plane. So you realize that in the ship, they also need to dispose of their waste. And then somebody will ask, how do they dispose of their waste? The ship is moving. How do they dispose of their waste? They dispose it into the uh, waters. And then you, do, you don't just dispose your waste into somebody's international water. So the competent authorities will have to Supervise. They have to take all measures and make sure that they will monitor and control the discharge of the, the, the waste, the refuse in the ship. If you are throwing it into the, the, uh, the sea, they have to monitor. Ballast is just a, a, a waste water in the ship. So they have to make sure that you don't just dispose of your waste into somebody's international water. And then at the end, it may cause any uh, diseases or cause a health hazard for them. So they have to make sure that those waste that potentially they are disease causing or they have uh, something that can cause diseases and then contaminate international waters, they will not allow the ship to also dispose of it into it. And it could be a river. You realize that in some countries they have uh, rivers that cross borders. River, even Nigeria, when you look at this uh, river Niger, it's from uh, Niger coming. So it's not only in Nigeria, it starts from Niger. River Benue also goes to, I think, uh, is it Cameroon? And then even when you go to Democratic Republic of Congo, the Zaire River, it, it crosses border. The Nile River also crosses border. There are so many rivers that crosses border. And, other countries, they use them as international uh, waterway or they travel along them. And then, so if a ship on any river or a canal, how do you dispose of your waste? The uh, competent authorities will have to monitor so that you don't cause any diseases by disposing your waste into other countries' international waters. They are also responsible for supervision of service providers for services concerning travelers. So all service providers, they have to also supervise them. The caterers, the air hostess and all that. Those who take care of baggage, cargo and all that, conveyances, 
they have to also supervise their activities, the services that they render. But you should also bear in mind that everything that they do is about preventing or controlling international spread of diseases. So at the point of entry, they have to monitor the service provi providers, the services that they also provide to travelers. They also conduct inspections and medical examination as necessary. The service, especially the catering uh, officers and all that, from time to time, they have to do medical examination because you are dealing with uh, food and other things. And then diseases can also be as a result of food bomb. So you need to go through medical examination. Even now, if you are at the airport and then you are Se uh, you are providing services. They have to uh, test you, mandatory testing, so that you yourself, you don't give the COVID to somebody and then you also not get COVID from others. So they also need to conduct medical examination and also inspect to see whether the, uh, the service providers at the point of entry conform with the medical uh, procedures that has been set out. And then they have effective contingency arrangement to deal with an unexpected public health event. Every country should have a plan if there's, there should be an outbreak. How is a country going to deal with that? So there should be that. And then there should also be a contingency plan. The contingency plan may not even be part of your normal plan that you have. But in a, an emergency situation arises. Well, how do you deal with that? There should be that plan. When we reported two cases, initial cases of COVID in Ghana, how did we deal with that? Did we have any contingency arrangement or plan there? So you realize at a point, some, I think they, there were some flights from uh, UK. They have to quarantine all of them. It's a contingency plan. They have to quarantine all, all of them and then observe them for three weeks to see if some will, be, will test positive, some will also not test positive or develop the uh, COVID eventually. And then when they did that, you realize that most of them, I think they, they even add up to the increase, the high numbers that we are having, because a lot of them tested positive. So that is it. Every country should have a contingency plan there to deal with unexpected public health events and also communicate with the National IH Africa Point on the relevant public health measures taken pursuant to this regulation. Communicate with the National IH Africa Point on the relevant public health measures. So all these measures, the supervision, the control that the competent authority will have to do, they have to tell, let the national, international health regulation focal point be in the known because they are also, they are supposed to communicate with the, uh, the contact point, the WHO contact point. So everything that the competent authorities do, every measures that they put in place, the national IH Africa point is supposed to be in the know. They have to communicate it with that center. Then health measures recommended by WHO for travelers baggage, cargo containers, conveyances, goods, postal parcels, and human remains arriving from an affected area may be reapplied on arrival if there are verifiable indication or evidence that the measures applied on departure from the affected area were not successful. So before a conveyance leave, or set, start the journey, wherever they are coming from, they are also supposed to inspect. The competent authorities there are supposed to inspect the, 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 the travelers, the baggage, cargo, and all that to make sure that they don't have any source of infection. But when you get to the, your, your exit point, you arrive in another country. Over there, to the competent authorities who also have to inspect all these things and then make sure that the health measures that were applied 
in case there were health measures applied in wherever you started your journey. They also have to make sure that those health measures are, were successful. But if there's, in case they were not successful, they also have every, whatever it is, or they are mandated to reapply the health measures again. If they have any indication, they can verify or they have evidence that the measures that were applied at the, uh, at the exit point were not successful. When you, you get to your country where you are exiting, they also have to apply. So for example, travelers that were quarantined, most of them were from UK. So if there had been any health measures applied when they were leaving UK, you know over there they were testing temperatures and all that before you leave. When they go to Ghana, and then Ghana, if we had any evidence that the measures that UK put in place were not successful, we also had every right to apply the health measures again. So when they got to Ghana, we also needed to take their temperatures, quarantine them. These, are, these were all health measures. We will quarantine them over three weeks. And then truly, within that three weeks, some also developed or were tested positive of the COVID. So that is what they are talking about here. And all these things have to be done by the competent authorities. Then disinfection, the rating, disinfection, decontamination, and other sanitary procedures shall be carried out so as to avoid injury as far as possible, discomfort to persons or damage to the environment. So in applying all these health measures, you are dis disinfection, you are de-rating, disinfection, decontamination. You have to make sure that you are not going to cause any damage to travelers or you are not going to cause any discomfort to any person, or you are not going to damage anybody's uh, baggage or cargo. And even the environment, in applying, you know you use chemicals and all that in applying all these health measures, but you have to, it has to be done in such a way that you are not going to destroy or damage the environment. And then at the end, we may have a, a negative public health impact. So you look at all these things, yes, you are applying health measures, but you make sure that you are avoiding injury. And then you are also avoiding discomfort to persons or damage to the, the environment. And then you are also avoiding damage to people's baggage, cargo, and containers, because they can also see you. If you damage somebody's property unlawfully, the person can also uh, sue you. So everything will have to be done, and it should be done safely. Okay, any question on that? So we'll move on to the public health measures. What are the, some of the measures that the regulation mandates every state party to, to put in place? The first one is health measures on arrival and departure. In arriving in one country or departing, what are some of the measures that needs to be put in place? They are saying that subject to applicable international ag uh, agreements and relevant articles of this regulation, a state party may require for public health purposes on arrival or departure. So you note, it's only for public health purposes. You have to require this information from uh, people departing or arriving in your country. And then with regards to travelers, you, you need the information concerning the traveler's destination so that the traveler may be contacted. So those of you who have traveled before, you realize that the, uh, at times you fill the form before you even board the, the plane. Or within, inside the plane, you are given some forms to fill. And so you, you need, they need your information. The country will need your information concerning where you are going your destination, so that they can contact you. So still, when you look at what is happening uh, in Ghana here, those, especially those who entered before we placed the restriction on living and coming into Ghana, you realize that some of them, they started developing the, con uh, the condition. 
So if they had not filled this form, there was no way we would have been able to uh, get them. Some reported at the hospital, and then by taking their history, they realized that they, they had uh, returned from a, an affected country. But you have to give the information concerning your, your destination. And everybody who has traveled before, you realize that you fill that form, and you indicate where you are going, your final destination. And at times, even where you are going to stay, you have to put the address on, on the form so that if there's anything, they can quickly contact you. They know where to get you. Uh, in the COVID, there was this professor in Legon. I think that they said their daughter traveled. So when the daughter came, and then they realized, I think the, the lady, the case that were identified in Legon, they were on the same flight. So they have to contact everybody on that flight. And then they, they gave them self-quarantine for three weeks. And they, were, they were communicating with them how they were doing and all that so that the test proved negative. And then for that professor, he saw that as a plus. If they had not uh, collected the information concerning their de uh, destination, they wouldn't have been able to contact them. So that side is very key. You need information on traveler's destination. Then information concerning the traveler's itinerary to ascertain if there were any travel in or near an affected area or other possible contact with infection or contamination prior to arrival. So you need information on the itinerary, the program of the traveler. You have to find out, is the person coming from an affected area? Wherever the person is coming from into your country, is there any public health risk happening there? So you look at that. If there's any public health risk that has international concern happening there, then that person will have to be a suspect. You, you need that. Then you also have to find out whether the person has had any contact with any contamination or any affected person. You realize that during the Ebola era in 2014, the case that took the Ebola to U uh, US, it was a Nigerian. And that Nigerian visited, uh, uh, I said Nigerian, Liberian, sorry. And then he had just visited Liberia. And then when he came to Liberia, some of his relatives had Ebola. So he was the one. In fact, the BBC reported that he, he even took the, uh, the relative. There was no vehicle. So he has to even put the relative in a, a wheelbarrow and then wheel the person to the hospital. After that, he also left to the U.S. And then when he got to U.S., he started showing the symptoms of Ebola. So he checked into a hospital. And then finally, though he died, the nurse and then the doctor that took care of him, they also had it, but they were able to contain it and we didn't hear of them again. So you realize that they have to find out. That person, yes, you are, uh, is it, you, base, you are based in US. And that time there was no Ebola happening in US. So how did you get it? Did you have any contact with somebody who had it? Have you been in an area where that the risk of Ebola was happening? Yes, he just returned from Liberia. So then it means that they had to also look at that. So they also need your, to ascertain whether you are coming from an affected area or you have any contact with somebody who is an affected or any contamination before you arrive in that state party, in that state party. And then they also look at your health documents, if they are required, if there's the need to look at your health document. Anybody, everybody traveling, you have a health document. There are certain uh, immunization or inoculation that you should take. For example, anybody uh, or any people who live in Africa, you have to take the yellow fever vaccine because yellow fever is endemic in Africa. So when you get there, they will look at your health document. Is it 
site that you are coming from, the health document will also give information concerning the health status of wherever you are coming from. Is there the need for you to take any vaccine and you haven't done it or you have taken it? So all these things are the things that you need to, these are the health measures on arrival and departure that every state party will have to comply with. Okay. Then they will also look at non-invasive medical examination, which is the least intrusive examination that would achieve the public health objective. If there's the need for you to take any health measure, uh, it should be non-invasive. It should be something you know what an invasive and then intrusive by the definition, you know what, what it is. So as I was saying, you have, to, you have to do that. That is why we take the yellow fever inoculation. And then you, we, will do, we will need to do that. If there's a need for you to take that inoculation, then you do that. If there's a need for any medical examination, it should be non-invasive. And then it should also be uh, the least intrusive. The non-invasive, we know what a non-invasive is when you are taking somebody's temperature and all that. You are looking at the years and all that. They are all non-invasive. But if there is the need to uh, be intrusive, you go deeper. Then it should be the least. So, for example, the, the yellow fever vaccine is a, is a least intrusive if there is the need because to do that. We are looking at public health risk. So if they suspect that where you are going or where you are coming, there is a, a public health risk existing, then you need to go through certain medical examination and it should be non-invasive and it should be least intrusive. Then inspection of baggage, cargo containers, conveyances, goods, postal parcels, and human remains. All these items will have to be inspected. The, the baggage, your cargo, your containers, your goods and postal parcels will need to be inspected. If it's, it's something that you, you are not supposed to travel with, then they will not allow you to travel with that. When you go to the, some of the airports, you realize that they've pasted, you see they've pasted a list of items that you are not supposed to travel with. You will see them. So if they should find anything in your, in your things, then they can, you can be uh, prosecuted or they may just confiscate it. On the basis of evidence of public health risk, obtained through the measures provided in paragraph one of this article, or through other means, state parties may apply additional health measures. So these are the health measures that the regulation has spelled out. Notwithstanding, if there's the need to apply additional measures, all countries that has ascribed to the WHO have the uh, mandate to apply other additional health measures. If provided the health measures, the additional health measures will achieve the public health aim of preventing international spread of disease. Especially when it comes to suspect or affected travelers. On a case by case basis, the least intrusive and invasive medical examination that will achieve the public health objective or prevent the, uh, the international spread of disease. That is what I was just saying. They are supposed to apply the health measures that the, uh, the regulation has spelled out. But if for some reason there is any uh, suspected traveler, the country has the mandate or the authority to apply other health uh, measures. And then those health measures to aim at achieving the public health objective issue should aim at achieving preventing international spread of disease. And then it should be no, it should be the least intrusive or invasive examination. And it should be on case by case basis. The case by case basis, yes, because for, for example, all of us, we are traveling. You are all in the same flight traveling. And then you are checking our temperature. And the one person's temperature is up. And then you suspect that person. 
Meanwhile, all of us, we all had uh, temperatures were normal. You have to deal with that person alone. You can't say that because we are all in the same flight, then it means that maybe, for example, we all have Ebola or we all have uh, COVID-19. You, you, you deal with the traveler on a case-by-case -case basis. And then all should be in achieving the public health aim or objective of preventing international spread of disease. No medical examination vaccination, prophylaxis, or health measures under this regulation shall be carried out on travelers without their prior express informed consent or that, that of their parents or guardians, except as provided in paragraph 2 of Article 33 and in accordance with the law an international obligation of the state party. You have to note this section. No medical examination, vaccination, prophylaxis, or health measures under this regulation shall be carried out on travelers without their prior express informed consent. So you cannot apply this uh, health measures or do any medical examination on a traveler without the person's uh, consent. If you are giving vaccination, it should be by the person's consent. The person will have to agree to it. You can't just do it. You cannot come and give me vaccination when I have not agreed to it. If you do that, somebody can sue you. And if you are giving prophylaxis, you know what a prophylaxis is for prevention of diseases. Even that, you need a person's consent. If by reason the person cannot consent, the person is, uh, is a child and cannot consent, then you need the, the consent of the guardian or the parent. If for some reason the person is, uh, let me see, is it uh, mentally deranged, then you need the consent of the guardian or the parent. You can't say that. Because a person is mentally deranged, well, that person doesn't know anything. So you can do anything on that person. You need the person's approval. You need the person's consent before you can carry out any medical examination. Travelers to be vaccinated or offered prophylaxis pursuant to this regulation or the appearance or guidance shall be informed of any risk associated with vaccination or with non-vaccination, the use or non-use of prophylaxis in accordance with the law and international obligation of the state party. So the vaccination, the examination that you are giving, you, they have to, you have to explain everything to the traveler or the parents or guardians. You have to let them know the, 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 the safety aspect of it. That if you take, for example, if you take uh, the yellow fever, or if, for example, if we should have vaccine for COVID, you have to explain that when we are given the COVID vaccine, when you come in contact with an affected person, you may not contract it. You let them know. And then you also let them know the risk of taking the vaccine because you know vaccines they may also have their adverse uh, uh, risk they may also have adverse effect so you let them know that maybe when you take it you have this reaction you let them know and then those who say that you will not take it like now what is happening that even though the vaccine for covid hasn't come out people are crying foul that even through the vaccine the, the uh, international community, especially the America, they may put things inside that will ra rather wipe we, the Africans, and then they will come and take over our, our country or our land. So already people are preparing people's mind not to take that vaccine. So you will also need to let them know what they stand for. If you don't take the vaccine, the dangers that you, you also stand for. So vis-a-vis, -vis, if you take the vaccine, this is what will happen. If you don't take it, this is what will happen. You have to give 
the information to the traveler so that the traveler can make an informed choice. And all these things will have to be within the laws, the international obligations of that state party. And this state party shall inform medical practitioners of this requirement in accordance with the law of the state party. So medical practitioners should be in the known of the vaccines that when you are traveling, you have to take. You realize that, I think I've forgotten the year, they, they played the World Cup in South, South Africa. And then the Ghanaian contingency that went, they were supposed to take, uh, I think that was, was it when they had the bird flu? They were supposed to take the vaccine and they didn't take it. So when they got to South Africa, they didn't allow them to enter. You either take and then you pay, you pay so much, or the next available flight, you go back to your country. So the medical practitioners will have to be in the know that these are the, uh, the mandatory health measures that should be for every person traveling. And then nobody is supposed to be an exemption. Okay. Then any medical examination, medical procedure, vaccination or other prophylaxis which involves a risk of disease transmission shall only be performed on or administered to a traveler in accordance with established national or international safety guidelines. Any medical examination, medical procedure, vaccination or other prophylaxis which involve a risk of disease transmission shall only be performed on or administered to a traveler in accordance with established national or international safety guidelines and standards as to minimize such risk. Any medical examination and medical uh, procedures, vaccination, which involve the risk of disease transmission. So you realize that some of the, especially the vaccine, some they call it attenuated uh, vaccine. The attenuated vaccine, actually, they have the live organism inside. For example, I think the measles or whatever, one of them, they have this, and then you see that they have a live a virus or bacteria inside, but just that they have weakened it so that it will, when they give it to you, it will not, it's not supposed to give you a, the disease, but rather protect you. But some of them will actually, after taking it, will actually be against you. So they have to let people know and then when you are giving people such a vaccine or medical examination that will, may result in disease transmission, there are certain international guidelines that you need to follow. And that has, that has to be followed to the core so that you minimize such risk. Even this, our common uh, chloroquine, those days that we take the chloroquine injection, people have serious reaction to it. So when you are giving somebody the injection, there should be an antidote by it. Somebody can just die within a short minute by reacting to some of these uh, medical procedures. So you have to follow that international safety guidelines and then you make sure that you minimize such risk. So we we'll move to Article 24. And Article 24 is about conveyance operators. You know what the conveyance is and who are the operators. When you look at the definition when we started, it will let you, it will clear your understanding and let you know who the conveyance operators are. And they also have obligation that they have to follow. Every state party shall take all practical measures consistent with this regulation to ensure that conveyance operators comply with the health measures recommended by WHO and adopted by the state party. So it is the duty of the countries or the state parties to make sure that conveyance operators comply with all those health measures that we just talked about. And also inform travelers of the health measures recommended by WHO and adopted by the state party for applicable for application on board. So the state party will have to let 
the conveyance operators be in the known of the health measures that WHO has come out with and also inform travelers of the health measures so that when you apply it on travelers, they, they will not be suspicious. Everybody knows that when you are traveling, these are the health measures that you have to follow or go through. And also permanently keep conveyances for which they are responsible free of sources of infection. So conveyance operators, they have to make sure that their conveyances don't harbor any source of infection or contamination. There, sh there should not be any vectors or reservoir on board of any of the conveyance. And then the application of measures to control sources of infection or contamination may be required if evidence is found. So conveyance operators, these are the, their duties. They have to make sure that their conveyances are free of sources of infection. And then they also make sure that there is also periodic application of measures to control sources of infection and contamination. If there's the need or there's evidence that they, they harbor any source of infection in their con uh, conveyances. And then when you, you look at the NS4 and the NS5 talks about specific provisions concerning or pertaining to conveyance operators. The NS4 talks about the, uh, what conveyances are supposed to, the operators are supposed to do. And then the measures that should be in place in any conveyance, regard, especially regarding the uh, vector bone diseases. And that is in the NS5. And I think I will send NS5 to you through your WhatsApp. But this is the NS4. NS4 talks about the technical requirements pertaining to conveyance and then conveyance operators. The NS4 and the NS5, you don't have it on the slides that I gave you, so I'll have to send it to you. NS4 talks about the requirements for conveyance and conveyance operators. operators. So the conveyance operators, first, conveyance operators shall, first, they are supposed to facilitate the inspection of the cargo containers and conveyances. They facilitate the inspection of con uh, containers and conveyances. And then they are supposed to also facilitate medical examination of persons on board their conveyance, then application of other health measures under this regulation. And then provision of relevant public health information requested by the state party. So these are the rules of the conveyance operators. The is to facilitate uh, the inspection of the cargo and containers and conveyance, the medical examination of persons on board their conveyances, then application of other health measures under this regulation, application of other health measures on their conveyances, and then the provision of relevant public health information if the state party or the country where they operate, if there's the need for any public health information regarding their conveyance, they are supposed to, it's the duty of the conveyance operators to provide. Then conveyance operators shall also provide to the competent authority a valid ship sanitation control exemption certificate or a ship sanitation control certificate or a maritime declaration of health the health parts of an aircraft general declaration. So these are all health documents. We talked about the ship sanitation control exemption certificate and then the sanitation control certificate. So in the ship, a ship when it's moving, based on inspection, the ship is either given ship sanitation control exemption certificate or sanitation control certifi certificate. And there is also another document called Maritime Declaration of Health. So the Maritime Declaration of Health also spelled out the health status of the, the ship that is moving. Then when you come to aircraft, then they also have the document that they call the Aircraft General Declaration of uh, uh, Health. Within the aircraft, we have the, the General Declaration of uh, Health status in it and it's the duty of the pilot to provide to the competent authorities. So the conveyance operators are supposed to provide 
to the competent authorities this document that has been listed. And that is what the NS4 of the regulation talks about. Then the session B is also about conveyance. Conveyance, conveyances, control measures apply to baggage, cargo, containers, conveyances, and goods, and that this regulation shall be carried out so as to avoid, as far as possible, injury or dis, uh, discomfort to person or damage to the baggage cargo. I've talked about this already. So in applying the conveyance within the conveyances, when you're applying any health measure, you have to make sure that you are not going to injure or discomfort any person. Neither are you going to damage any baggage, cargo, or containers, or conveyances. And then whenever possible, an appropriate control measures shall be applied when the conveyance and holds are empty. You realize that in applying the health measures, we are saying that you have to avoid injury or damage. So it's better the health measures are applied or control measures are applied when the conveyance is empty. Conveyance is empty, the hold is empty. They're normally, what the holds are applied to the ship. So you realize you have to make sure that if you are applying any health measure to a ship, it has to be done when the ship is empty. If it's an aircraft, it has to be done when the aircraft is empty. If it's a, 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 if it's a passenger car, it has to be done when it is empty so that you don't discomfort any human being, you don't destroy any cargo or goods of people. And then state parties shall include in writing the measures applied to cargo containers or conveyances, the parts treated, the method employed, and the reason for the application. So within the state party, any time they inspect any conveyance, they have to give a written information to the conveyance operators. So you have to indicate, you have to indi indicate the, the, uh, the areas that you treat. The method that you use, if it's a derating, how did you go about it? If it's disinfection, is it by spraying and all that? You have all these things will have to be in a written form, and it's, it should be given to the one in charge of if it's an aircraft, the one in charge of the aircraft, and if it's, it's a, the ship, you you it has to be on the ship sanitation control certificate. So if it's an aircraft, a written document, and then you give it personally to the one in charge of the aircraft. And we know the pilot is the one in charge of the aircraft. But if it is a ship, you have to, it has to be indicated on the ship sanitation control certificate. And it's also given to the one in charge of that ship. And that is the captain. For other cargo containers and conveyances, State parties shall issue such information in writing to consignors. The consigner is the one sending or sending a shipment or the goods, and then consignee is the one receiving. So if it's apart from the, the, the ship or the aircraft, for any other cargo or any conveyance, they have to issue, the such information will have to be in written form and is given to the consigner, the consign either the consigner, the consignee, the carrier, and then the person in charge of that conveyance, or their respective agent. So whoever is an agent of the conveyance can also be given the written information where you indicate whatever you did. The the method that you use, if it's a derating, how did you go about it? and it has to be in a written form, and then you give it to the person in charge of the, the conveyor, the, uh, the conveyance, and it can also be the consignee, the one sending the goods, and then even the one receiving the goods. And then the Annex 5. Annex 5 talks about measures for vector-borne diseases. How do you deal with vector-borne diseases? And then WHO shall publish on a regular basis, a list of areas where 
disinsection or other vector control measures are recommended for conveyances arriving from these areas. So WHO is the duty of WHO to publish the list, let people know which areas are endemic for vector borne diseases. That when you are coming from these areas, maybe you may need to take certain precautions. And then when you arrive at a, a, another state party, they also need to take certain precautions. So you have, they, they will publish the list of areas where you have vector borne diseases. We, we, when you look at, I think I went to do some calls in Manchester. And over there, when you go, there's this small booklet that they give you. And then they have listed in that book, they list areas where you go, the precaution that you need to take. For example, if you are coming to Africa, they tell you that these are the diseases that public health diseases or disease that has public health importance. Then you have to be cautious of. They have all that. So that is it. WHO will have to list, publish the list of endemic areas where you have danger zones. If you are going to this place, these are the conditions that the vector one conditions existing in those areas. And then they will publish it to, to let people know so that the necessary precaution can be taken. Then every conveyance leaving a point of entry situated in an area where vector control is recommended should be disinsected and keep free of vectors. Every conveyance leaving a point of entry situated in an area where vector bone control is recommended should be disinsected and kept free of vectors. So if you have a conveyance operator, any conveyance leaving an endemic area, areas where you have any source of infection, then it means that that container will have to be disinfected. You have to apply health measures to that container. And when there are methods and then materials advised by organization, that is the WHO, for these procedures, this should be employed. So in disinfecting or disinfecting the conveyances, you have to apply the methods that WHO has specified. And then if there are also other measures that can achieve the same, uh, the same aim stated by the state party, you have to apply that. But strictly, you have to go by what WHO has also specified. And then the presence of vector, vectors on board the conveyance and then the control measures used to eradicate them shall be included. So you have to also, when you are using WHO methods, you also look at the control measures. Which control measures are you using to eradicate them? You have to include everything. In the case of aircraft, so it's the same as previously what we talked about. It should be in a, a written form, and then it should be given to whoever is in, in charge of the conveyance. It has to be on the, if it's an aircraft, you give it to the general declaration, the aircraft general declaration. And if it's the ship, it has to be on the ship sanitation control certificate. Then in the case of conveyances, on a written proof of treatment issued to the consignee. So the method is the same as what is spelled out in the NS4. And then state parties should accept this disinsecting, directing, and other control measures for conveyances applied by other states if methods and materials advised by WHO have been used. So every country, you have to, whatever, if you, before you can even apply any health measure, you look at where the, uh, the conveyance is coming from. If they applied health measures, and the measures they applied is the same as what WHO has specified, you have to accept that. So for example, a, a, a plane coming from, uh, let's say, UK to Ghana in this week of the COVID, if they had applied health measures that are successful, and that measure is something that WHO has approved, Ghana, when the, the aircraft gets to Ghana, Ghana will have to accept it. 
you can say that no, I will not, unless you have evidence that that health measure is not successful. But if you don't have any evidence and you think it's successful, and the person used the, the, the con uh, conveyance operator use what the BHO has specified, then Ghana, you, you are obliged to accept, you, are, you have to accept that health measure that was applied by that state party. Then state parties shall establish programs to control vectors that may transport an infectious agent that constitute a public health risk to a minimum distance of 400 meters from those areas of point of entry facilities. State parties shall establish programs to control vectors that may transport an infect, uh, infectious agent that constitutes a public health risk. So all that is saying is that in applying the health measure, you have to make sure that you restrict the conveyance from a point where uh, travelers are. At least it should be away from that point by 400 meters. You don't disinfect or derate or apply the health measures where the travelers are because you realize that we talked about the fact that you have to avoid injury to persons, comfort to persons, damage to uh, cargo, baggage and all that. So in applying the health measure or control, vector control measures, you restrict the, the affected conveyance to a minimum distance of 400 meters from those areas of point of entry facilities that are used or operated involving travelers, conveyance, containers, and all that, because we are avoiding discomfort and injury to persons and then cargo and other things. If a follow-up inspection is required to determine the source of the vector control measures applied, the competent authorities for the next known port or airport of call with a capacity to make such an inspection shall be informed of this requirement in advance by the competent authority advising such follow-up. If a follow-up inspection is required to determine the success of the vector control measures applied, the competent authorities for the next the next known port or airport of call with a capacity to make such an inspection shall be informed of this requirement. So if there's any proof that the health measures applied wasn't successful and there's the, the follow-up inspection to make sure that the measures were successful, then the competent authority at the wherever uh, the conveyance or the aircraft, wherever the aircraft is going, you have to also find out from where they initiated the, uh, the health measures. So you can't just sit at one point and say that maybe, for example, the conveyance is coming to Ghana. Then it comes to Ghana and Ghana says that, oh, it's not successful. The measures that Nigeria applied wasn't successful. When you don't have any evidence, but if you have evidence, then you have to also let Nigeria know that the measures that they applied, the health measures or the control measures that they applied was not successful. So there's the need for Ghana to also reapply the health measures again. And all these things will have to be on the ship sanitation control certificate, all those traveling documents by the conveyances. And a conveyance may be regarded as suspect and should be inspected for vectors and reservoirs if the following are applied. Before a, a state party or country can say that a conveyance is affected, all these may, uh, conditions will have to be applicable. First, it has, you have to be sure that it has a possible case of vector-borne disease on board. So if you earmark uh, a conveyance as unaffected, it has to have a case, a possible case of vector bond disease on board. You should have evidence that there's a disease causing agent on board. And then B, a possible cause of vector bond disease. There's actual, there's the cause of a vector bond disease. 
For example, you have seen a rat on it, on the ship. Then you, you, you know that there's a possible case of vector bond disease. And then it has also occurred on board during the international voyage. So in the international travel, as the ship is moving, you have, in, you have indication that there is a case of vector bond disease on, on board. Then you can see that that ship is affected. Then it has left an affected area within a period of time where on board vectors could still carry diseases. So these are the conditions. First, you are looking at whether there's a possible case of vector bond disease. And then there's another one is the case of vector bond disease has occurred whilst in the course of the journey, somebody has reported with a, a vector bond disease. And then the, the uh, conveyance is also leaving or just left an affected, affected area, area where there's evidence that there's a vector bond disease. So you realize that South Korea or Singapore, there was this uh, cruise ship that they quarantined. And then there were also cases of uh, COVID on board cruise ship. So they had to quarantine that cruise ship. It became a suspect. And I think America too, they, there was a ship like that. So before you can uh, classify a ship as an affected, all these conditions will have to be applicable. Then a state party should not prohibit the landing of an aircraft or berthing of a ship in its territory if the control measures provided for in paragraph 3 of the annex or otherwise recommended by WHO are applied. So state party or country, you don't have, you have no right to say that you not allow any ship to berth or board at your, your port. If that the ship has used, actually used the health measures that WHO has uh, specified, you can't say that you will not let the ship stop at your port. If the ship, they have used the recommended health measures specified by WHO, then no country can prevent or prohibit the landing of such an aircraft or a ship. However, aircraft or ship coming from an affected area may be required to land at airports or divert to another port specified by the state party. We are saying that, the, or the regulation is saying that if health measures specified by WHO has been applied, no country has the right to stop or prohibit the landing of an aircraft in its territory. But then, if the aircraft is coming from an affected area, then they will have to, they will require that it will land at an airport or divert to another port, another place, so that further investigation can be done. If health measures has been applied to an aircraft, no state party or no country can prevent it from landing. But if that aircraft is coming from an area that we know that is a danger zone, though like initially when the COVID started happening in China, if we know that an aircraft is coming from China, then Ghana could have said that we will not let you land at Kutuka, land somewhere, and then we'll come and check if there's no any uh, infection on board before we can allow you to come in land at the appropriate place. So that is what this session is talking about. A state party may apply vector bomb measures to a conveyance arriving from an area affected by a, a vector bomb disease. If the vector for the foregoing disease are present in this territory, so you, you realize that this is a two-way thing. The, the a conveyance is coming from an affected area. And then wherever the conveyance is going, there's also, it's also an affected area, or if the same disease condition is happening there, then there's the need to apply for that state party to apply control measures. You are coming from an affected area. And then where you are coming to, we ourselves, we are also affected. Then it means that they have to apply control measures to that uh, conveyance or the aircraft coming so that you will be sure that the necessary precaution or prevention
has gone on.